just have a few more people finding their seats and we'll get started shortly. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. It's uh, absolutely wonderful to see so many of you here in person today. Uh, thank you for joining us on such a warm day. Um, the auditorium stays nice and cool throughout, so uh, wonderful to, to have you. And I do believe we have more than 100 um, uh, joining us via Zoom as well. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Vivian Richter and I am the communications manager at the Garvin Institute, which means that uh, it is my great privilege to work very closely with our incredible researchers and to help communicate the groundbreaking discoveries that they are making. Now, before we start off and kick off today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge their ongoing connection to land, waters, and culture. Now, we have an incredible seminar in store for you today, uh, where we will hear about some of our groundbreaking discoveries from the year that was. And we will hear from three of our research super superstars. That's Dr. Etienne Malfakwa. Uh, Dr. Ruth Pidsley and Professor Tree Fan, and they will talk about some of their groundbreaking research discoveries and will give you an update on the work that they are doing. Uh, regarding the format, we will have a Q&A after the presentation, so at that point, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, uh, in get in touch with any questions that you might have about the research. And of course, if you are joining us via Zoom, please feel free to type in your questions to the Zoom chat function at any point during the presentation, um, and I will try to get to it at the uh, conclusion of the presentations. Now, before we begin, I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to Garvin's Executive Director, that is Professor Benjamin Kyle. Benjamin is a, an internationally recognized medical researcher who has made significant contributions to the understanding of cancer, stem cells, and inflammatory disease. Now, among his many achievements, his work has shed light on a process called apoptosis, um, otherwise known as programmed cell death. And this uh, informed the development of a new class of cancer drugs, which was approved by the FDA in 2016. And I think we will be lucky enough to hear a little bit about his research journey today. Uh, Benjamin also has extensive experience in senior leadership roles, uh, most recently as the executive dean at the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Adelaide. Um, and we are, of course, very lucky that he joined Garvin in April of this year. Uh, please join me in welcoming our executive director, Professor Benjamin Kyle. Thank you, Vivian, for that very, very generous introduction. And welcome, everybody. It's, um, it's wonderful to see you all here in person. And to those of you online, um, it's a real, real pleasure um, to be part of today. This is our final public seminar for 2023, um, and um, it really is uh, a thrill to be having it here today in the auditorium, to have you online. And I think um, I'm as excited about the, the three speakers we have today as you are. It's a, it's a fantastic lineup. I've been asked to, to introduce myself, um, as it were, to the, to the Garvin community. I've been here for seven months, and I've been asked to say a few words about who I am, uh, my research career, and, and what's led me to Garvin, and, and a few words about where I see Garvin going in the next few years. So I'm very happy to do that. I started um, my research career um, at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in 1997. I did an honours degree um, studying birth defects with Professor Andy Chu, which was really my introduction to, to medical research. And, that was a really formative year for me, but I wasn't sure that developmental biology was, was what I wanted to do. I was, I was interested in, in cancer research. So in 1998, I moved to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, which is in, in Parkville, in Melbourne. Many of you will have heard it. It's something of a sister institution to the Garvin, um, very similar in, 
in terms of its focus on really hardcore molecular biomedical research. And there I worked with Professor Doug Hilton and Warren Alexander um, studying blood cell production and function and the, the dysregulation that leads to leukaemia. So that was the early, early 90s, uh, late 90s rather, uh, early 2000s. It um, was an incredibly exciting time for, for medical research. And in particular, it was incredibly exciting because that's the point where the human genome was being sequenced, the first human genome. So I finished my PhD and was desperate to get overseas, desperate to get to America where this was all happening. I went to a place called Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and uh, worked in a department that was involved in the Human Genome Project and learnt a lot about genomics and genetics and, and how the, the understanding of, of the human genome was going to unravel the complexities of disease. Um, that experience was, was obviously formative for me and, and really shaped the research that I went on to do uh, back in Australia, primarily at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute, but um, in many ways it's, it's relevant to, to why we're here today and that being Garvin and, and Garvin's research. You've all seen the, the staircase um, in, the, in the Galleria, um, which represents the, the DNA helix, um, and that was really a visionary piece of architecture at the time. Um, not just because it's a beautiful structure, but it, it really does um, articulate what Garvin is about, and Garvin is about that fundamental element of the genome um, which underpins who we are, um, how we interact with the world, and, and uh, the kind of diseases that we're predisposed to, and, and how we respond um, to, to microbes and bugs, and how we respond to different drugs and different therapies, and, and ultimately our life journey. So over the last 20 years, genomics has, has absolutely exploded. And Daniel MacArthur, one of our genomic superstars here at Garvin, I heard him speak the other day and he said that if you'd, um, if you'd looked at the, the cost of sequencing the human genome the first time around um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and you, you relativise it to, uh, Daniel's a bit of a car person, if you relativise it to the cost of a Lamborghini, you, know, you would have paid $650,000 um, we can now sequence a genome, um, if you're talking about the equivalent cost of that car, for under 10 cents. Uh, that's, that is how much the technology has changed. And Garvin's been at the forefront of that um, revolution. So Garvin's making enormous strides in the ability to decode the human genome and translate that into understanding of human disease. But Garvin does a lot more than genomics, as you know. Um, we, we research a whole range of diseases from um, relatively rare inherited diseases through to really complex um, diseases that have genetic elements like diabetes. But we're also very, very strong and have been for a long time in cancer and in immunology. And going back to my own research journey, which took me back to Australia to the Weehi, then onto Monash and University of Adelaide, um, those three threads have, have really come together for me. When I was doing my PhD and throughout the 20, 2010s, there were most cancer biologists who thought that cancer was cancer, and then you had immunologists who thought the immune system was about the immune system and B cells and T cells and fighting off infections. And then there was a very small group in the middle who thought that the two things were somehow connected, that immunology was involved in suppressing cancer and the immune system could be utilised to, to fight cancer. And in the last 15 years, you've seen an absolute revolution as it's been proven beyond doubt that the immune system can be used to to target cancer in human beings. Um, and you've probably heard about checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapies and CAR T cells. And it's been the most extraordinary advance in cancer research in history, but it's also been the most extraordinary conceptual advance because it showed that most of us, most of us cancer biologists, were wrong. Um, so it's been a revelation in, at a personal level and a, on a global level to realise how extraordinary science is, the way different elements come together, the way different ideas ebb and flow, and how absolutely backwards many, many scientists can get it a lot of the time because of the way we're brought up, the way we're educated in different fields. And so it's been a fascinating um, journey and an incredibly exciting one. And it's really what brought me to Garvin because Garvin has those three, th three threads, genomics, immunology, and cancer. And we are exceptionally strong in those three pillars. So. The beautiful thing about being strong in immunology when you do cancer research is that so much of cancer now is understood to be involved in the immune system. The beautiful thing about studying genomic diseases when you're strong in immunology is that so many disease processes intersect with or are affected by the immune system. 
Um, so Garvin's a pretty unique place in Australia. We have those incredible strengths, cutting edge, and it gives us this really fertile and rich ecosystem in which we can move from genomics to cancer to immunology and back again and very quickly start to translate findings in one area to another. And I think that's what you're going to see today. Three outstanding researchers with three incredibly different but related stories in terms of the technologies they use, um, the, the, the cell systems they use, the model systems they use, and the way that translates into human patients. So um, after 26 years in medical research, I came to Garvin in April this year um, for a very, very specific reason, and that is because I think it's an extraordinary place. Um, it's the jewel in the crown of medical research in New South Wales. Um, I'm very excited to be in Sydney, having spent 30 years in Melbourne, listening to Melburnians moan about Sydney <laughs> and Sydney ciders and how terrible you are. I'm here to tell you that after six months, I've, I'm a complete convert. Um, everything they say in Melbourne is a lie, um, <laughs> which perhaps won't surprise you. Um, Garvin's an incredible place. People have said, what have, what have your impressions been since coming to Garvin? Well, most of my impressions have been confirmed. It's an incredible place, some incredible scientists, incredible staff um, and students who support what we do here. Um, I did know that we had a pretty remarkable relationship with the community um, and a pretty remarkable relationship with our supporters and donors. Um, and that is the element for me that's really, really um, blown my mind, is the relationship and support of the community. Um, it's, it is unique. And I do know other medical research institute directors pretty well. And um, Garvin's relationship with its, with its supporters and donors and community is, is the envy of, of other institutions, and very fine institutions. So you should all be really proud to be a part of that. We're, we're all very proud to be part of the Garvin community, the broader community. It's incredibly exciting. And it's just a joy uh, to be here and to be here today to talk about, I really wish that photo of me wasn't up there. Um, <laughs> Couldn't we have something more scientific next time? Um, it's a joy to be able to, to, to have you all here today to, to talk about what we're doing. Um, that's why we're here, uh, to, to cure diseases. And the three folks you're going to hear from are engaged in doing that. Um, it's a thrill to be involved with Garvin. And um, I really hope you'll enjoy today. There's going to be Q&A and uh, a chance to chat afterwards. I'll be around. So please um, do come up and say hello, introduce yourselves, be happy to chat. But in the meantime, we'll get on with the science. Um, and I think we're starting with Etienne, who's a young rising star, um, who's converted himself from an immunologist to a rheumatologist. He's going to talk to you about uh, some really exciting work he's doing studying um, the rogue clones that contributed to the development of autoimmune disease. Etienne, over you. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you about some work that we're, we're really passionate about here. Uh, and it relates to how we're trying to use these methods called cellular genomics that you can see here and that I'm going to tell you more about uh, to try and better understand and thereby treat inflammatory arthritis. Uh, and there are many types of inflammatory arthritis. And so I think this has been touched on already, but a lot of what we do relates to how we try and understand the genome changes in these genes um, that we call mutations and how they might contribute to various diseases. But I thought I'd start by actually giving you a quick idea of how I came to be here and why I'm so passionate about what I do. And so uh, these are actually my parents that you can see here. They, uh, they've been studying plant physiology and climate change at the ANU in Canberra for more than three decades. And growing up till the age of 15, I spent a lot of my time doing homework and other things in the School of Biology there and seeing science around me, which was really special. And uh, at the age of 16, I was really inspired by a talk from a woman whom many of you would recognize, Fiona Wood. And she invented spray on skins and really changed the outcomes for people with uh, degree burns and, and, and others. And that really solidified my interest in, in medical science generally. And around the same time, I was really lucky that someone else that you'd probably recognize, Chris Goodnow, who became the director here for some time, uh, was kind enough to respond to an email from the 16-year-old me and let me run around the lab, essentially, uh, with one of his PhD students for three months. And that really solidified my my thought that immunology was what I wanted to do. And I'm half French, and so I went to Paris to study uh, science, medical science over there for two years. And again, I was really lucky to spend time there at the Pasteur and Imagine Institutes with a man called Alain Fischer, who became really internationally renowned for, for a lot of things, really, but in particular for studying, diagnosing, and treating people with these rare immune diseases. So you may have heard of sort of David Vedder and um, Bubble Boy and 
similar types of diseases that Alan Fisher was, was pioneering um, the treatment and, and diagnosis of, and I think we'll hear a lot more from that angle from Tree. So that really, um, my time there really solidified the idea because what I was doing in the lab was essentially running a really simple molecular technique called a PCR, and that was sufficient to say that yes or no, the individuals that we were interested in had a mutation in this gene called FAS, and if they did, that transformed the diagnosis to suddenly being um, a diagnosis of, of ALPS, and that changes the treatment of, of these patients. So that was a really clear example for me early on as to how genetics and genomics can really change outcomes for people with immune diseases. And so I came back to Canberra, I finished my undergrad there in medical sciences, and I, I did honors there to try and learn just a lot more about the fundamentals of how immune cells develop and their sheer complexity. And then I came to Sydney with the express purpose of starting my PhD with Chris Goodnow, who by then had moved here and launched a really exciting program called HOPE, studying many people with different types of autoimmune diseases. So I did my PhD here with Chris, and then transitioned about two years ago to work with Owen Siggs, who came to the Garvin on a really prestigious fellowship to essentially try and tease apart what we've been talking about, which is how these acquired changes in your DNA, these mutations, cause inflammatory um, diseases. And so my goal really now and, and going forward has been to help people with arthritis specifically and also with other inflammatory diseases. So you probably guessed this from the title of my talk and from what I've been saying, but what do these diseases all have in common? There's a lot of them here. Well, all these diseases are autoimmune. And you might recognize some of these names, lupus, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, and of course arthritis. But there's actually more than 100 of these different autoimmune diseases, and many of them are very poorly characterized. They're hard to tease apart in terms of diagnosis. And for the very large majority of them, they take a long time to diagnose. We don't necessarily know how to treat them very well. And so what I'm interested in, and what a lot of people here are very interested in, is what are the specific immune cells amongst all of your many cells that are doing good things that are actually going rogue to drive these autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases? Can we distinguish them from the millions or billions of other cells in your body? And very importantly, what actually causes these immune cells to go rogue? And that's a critical question. And so there's urgent need here. One in eight people will or have developed autoimmune disease throughout their lifetime. And this impacts um, patients, but also, of course, their loved ones in the wider community. And I think it's worth um, noting that this actually costs us twice the cost of treating cancer every year. And the reason for that is that these treatments are really nonspecific. They target our symptoms primarily, but not the underlying causes. And the reason for that is that typically we don't know the underlying causes of these diseases. And so autoimmune diseases remain chronic and they have no cure. And what you can see at the bottom here are these five prototypical examples of autoimmune diseases that we study here. Now, why am I interested in arthritis? Well, one of the key reasons, and here I'm telling you about rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, but this is true for other arthropathies, it affects up to one in 100 people worldwide. And treatments have really improved over the last two, three decades, but it remains a really chronic disease with no cure. And it really severely impacts quality of life. Just one example of that is that it increases risk of heart disease about 1.5 fold, which is quite astonishing. Now, psoriatic arthritis affects another one in 1,000 people, gout and osteoarthritis, another one in 50 and one in 20 people. And so collectively, these arthropathies will affect roughly one in 10 people in the population. Now, RA, and it's true for these other arthropathies, cause many clinical symptoms beyond what the ones that we typically think about, beyond joint pain and inflammation. They cause swelling, stiffness, predisposition to infections, osteoporosis, heart disease, as I mentioned. And I think also something that we really tend to underestimate is the fact that these conditions really affect not just the physical but also the mental health of patients and also their families. And so the goal here long term is to improve treatments and eventually even cure these diseases. Now, there's a long way to go. And the key challenge here is, well, how do we identify the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms of these diseases? And I just want to highlight here, you don't have to remember the details of this slide, but this is just one review showing what a few of the different cell types and molecular pathways are that we think might be involved in rheumatoid arthritis in various ways. So how do we go about cutting through this complexity to create really meaningful outcomes for people with arthritis? And that's a really difficult question. And I think Ben touched on this. This is where Garvin has a unique advantage, which is our unique combination of expertise to understand and study diseases. And that comes from clinical, scientific, and technological expertise. So in terms of the clinical expertise, I'm really lucky and I really value incredibly close relationships that we've been building with clinicians. And what that allows us to do is get really rigorous diagnoses, for one thing. And I mentioned that these autoimmune diseases and other diseases are very hard sometimes to properly characterize and diagnose. And these are clinicians who've been working on these diseases for many decades. Now, they're providing us, as you can see here, with detailed and ongoing clinical data from every patient that we enroll in these studies, and that's really important. And very importantly, we're not just studying blood, which gives us some level of information, but we're actually studying the affected joints in these individuals, so the sites of pathology. 
And what we try to do is that we try to guide our research in every case by starting with the key clinical problems and the key needs of patients in the community and going from there. And so one of the key major problems that we try to address are flares. And so RA, OA, and other arthropathies have what we call flares, and that's significant worsening of the, of the um, severity of disease. And these are really unpredictable. They're debilitating and they're treatment resistant. And what often happens is that someone will come into the clinic, they'll be diagnosed with an arthropathy. They'll start on a relatively non-specific treatment. And when their symptoms start to taper, the inclination of the clinician will be to start decreasing the dose or tapering the dose of that drug. And the reason for that is simple, is that these drugs have long-term side effects. But what often happens is that when the clinician starts tapering that dose, the patient will instead actually get a flare, at which point their severity of disease is worse than it was before, and in fact is no longer controlled by the same dose of drug we were using previously. So instead of, having, instead of being able to decrease our dose of these drugs, we're actually having to increase these doses over time. So that's a really critical problem. And what typically happens is that when an individual presents to the rheumatology clinic with a flare, as you can see, in this context, the effusion of someone's knee, which is the buildup of synovial fluid around that inflamed joint. The clinician will go in with a syringe and actually remove that synovial fluid to reduce the pain and inflammation in that patient, and they'll discard that fluid. But the thing is that fluid's an incredibly precious clinical resource. And so one of the things we've spent the last two years doing is figuring out the really complicated logistics to ensure that when an individual comes into a clinic into now one of the several main hospitals around Sydney, if they have a knee effusion, the rheumatologist gives me a call or texts me, and within two hours, the synovial fluid and the blood uh, are in the lab and being processed for experiments. And so that's really amazing. Now that brings me to the scientific, and I don't have time to, to touch on all of the amazing scientists and, and scientific expertise here, but some of the science that we were particularly interested in at the start of my PhD relates directly to these arthropathies, and that was this really striking observation. There's this type of rare CD8 T cell cancer. So CD8 T cells are a type of immune cell. There's this type of cancer of these CD8 T cells called TLGL where if the patients have a mutation or a change in the DNA in this gene called STAT3, 6% of them will have rheumatoid arthritis. So that's already six times more than the population incidence of RA. But if they have one or more mutations in this gene STAT3, 43% of them will have RA. So 40 times the incidence of RA in the general population. And so that led to one of my key hypotheses during the PhD, which was that this type of immune cell, these killer CD8 T cells, when they acquire mutations in STAT3, they're actually actively driving autoimmune disease. And I won't go into the details of this, but this was really our big study of rogue sort of CD8 clones, as we called them. And it took us six years, but essentially we were able to show that indeed killer CD8 T cells that acquire these STAT3 mutations are directly contributing to autoimmune disease and inflammation. And we use these methods called multiomics, and I'm about to touch on now to try and identify pathways. And we identified two pathways, molecular pathways in particular, that we think we can use to maybe selectively suppress or deplete these disease-causing cells. So that brings us to the technological expertise here at Garvin. Now, I've been using this term multiomics, and essentially what this multiomics term means is that within single cells, within thousands of different single cells, within the blood or within affected tissues from people with various diseases, we can now measure thousands of genes and hundreds of proteins per cell. And that's really unprecedented, and it's really been a revolution uh, primarily over the last five years. It's transforming a lot of medical research. And what it's giving us is unprecedented resolution to try and identify the rogue cells, as we call them, that are driving these inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, and identify whether any of these mutations also have, uh, cells have mutations that we can study, understand, and maybe even target. And so we're leveraging these methods now to study synovial fluid, for example, at incredible resolution. So that's the fluid that I mentioned to you from individuals with these really debilitating disease flares. Now, I just wanted to give you an example of what this data can look like. And so the plots that you're seeing here are basically two-dimensional renditions of the many thousands of genes and hundreds of proteins that we can measure in every individual cell. And every individual dot here is a single cell taken from the joints of about nine people with different kinds of arthritis. And what these graphs show us is the relative distance between these dots or cells tells us a little bit more about how different they are in terms of their gene and protein expression. Now, there are many things we can ask with these data, but one of the things that we can see pretty immediately is that in yellow and green, the cells with, uh, from people with gout and osteoarthritis are very different from those with people, uh, who, from people who have rheumatoid arthritis. Now, this is really hot off the press, but I wanted to mention it because we're quite excited about it. One of the things we can tell with this multiomic data is that specifically in this subset of cells, these cytotoxic CD8 T cells, we're finding what we call expanded clones. And we think these, these may be enriched for these rogue immune cells that are driving inflammation. Now, there's a long way to go, and that's an early result, but we're really excited about it, so I wanted to tell you. 
So we can do this in synova fluid, but we can also actually do it in the tissue, which is actually the tissue that's specifically being degraded or even attacked in, in individuals with these diseases. We can take the many cells from this tissue, identify them, and then within each of these thousands of single cells, we can actually screen them for mutations in key genes of interest like STAT3 that I just told you about. And I don't want to tell you that these methods are the be-all and end-all of inflammatory diseases and that we're going to be able to solve everything now that we've developed them or that they've been developed. But I wanted to highlight that there are incredibly exciting possibilities here. And this is one. It's not work out of the garden, but it's very telling. People with this disease called Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia were known for some time to harbour mutations in this key gene here, MyD88. Now, what was incredibly important that happened only a few years ago was that the researchers identified that individuals with this disease who do versus those who don't have mutations in this gene, MyD88, are incredibly more sensitive to treatment with this drug here that you can see, Ibrutinib. And what that now means in practice is that every individual with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia can be screened for mutations in this gene, MyD88, and if they have them treated with this drug, and it's really transforming outcomes for these people. So that's an example of how these sort of precision medicine approaches can rapidly translate to, to impact in, in, in our society. And so the goal here with this project and with many other related projects is, well, can we identify the rogue cells, the mutations and the pathways that are driving arthritis and arthritic diseases? And can we then leverage this knowledge to improve our early detection, our ongoing monitoring with disease progression and treatment outcomes? Can we actually guide the treatments because clinicians are faced with a wealth of possible choices at different times. Can we actually guide how and when they treat their patients? And importantly, can we develop or even repurpose existing drugs for precision therapies? And I just want to highlight that at the end of 2021, it was myself and my friend Manu Singh, who's a close collaborator, and the two of us were really interested in applying these methods to this disease. And in the space of two years, we're now collecting samples from 11 hospitals around Australia in various capacities, particularly within New South Wales and St Vincent's Hospital. And we've also built really incredible collaborations um, internationally. So Satu Musjoki in Helsinki is the world leader on STAT3 mutations in CD8s. And Dan Landau at the New York Genome Centre is a key world leader in these multi-omics methods. And so a lot of this clinical and scientific expertise is now converging on Garvin for these efforts. And with that, I just want to finish with something I'm really excited about. Well, what are we doing in 2024 to try and go further, go faster, and, and, and bring insights? We've got access through these incredible <coughs> collaborations with clinicians who are really passionate, we're really interconnected, and we, we talk about these problems all the time. And, and through those conversations, we can highlight and identify really um, key ways of moving forwards. And so one of the things that we've developed now is collaborations, particularly with St Vincent's Hospital next door, so that every individual, or amongst many individuals who are getting hip and knee replacements with arthritis next door, we can gather incredibly precious, otherwise discarded samples. In the context of the hip, we'll be able to study the affected synovial tissue from that person. From the discarded head of the femur, we can actually aspirate the bone marrow and study those cells. And within people with what we call unicompartmental disease, where one part of their knee that you can see here is affected, but the other is less so, we can, actually comp um, we can actually gather those samples separately and study the immune cells in both compartments. And what that means is that we're able to study immune cells in the hip joint, for example, as they attack it, as they develop in the bone marrow. In the context of the knee, we can compare the angry immune cells in one site versus the relatively normal immune cells in the other site. And of course, we're also studying blood, cartilage, and bone, which can give us really key insights into other aspects of arthritic diseases. And so with that, I want to give a really big thank you to the really passionate and involved clinicians and scientists who are involved in this work, our, our funding bodies and philanthropists, and in a major way, our um, patients and their families. And with that, if you have any future inquiries about this project, but also many other projects that are happening at Garvin Foundation um, are incredibly helpful and can direct you to the right place. So with that, I think I'm introducing our um, next speaker. And Dr. Ruth Pidsley is a group leader in epigenetics who does really amazing molecular work and how it ties into various diseases. And, We'll hear a bit more about what she's she's doing. So thank you for your time. Um, good morning. My name is Ruth Pidsley, and I'm a group leader here at the Garvin. And today, I'd like to tell you about our team's research into epigenetic biomarkers, which are a promising new tool for improving cancer treatment. 
So I'll begin with a short introduction to epigenetics so that you can appreciate what's, why it's such an exciting area of research at the moment. I'll then lay out the clinical problem that we set out to address for this particular prostate cancer study and then show you some of the results from this project and how we're now working to progress it towards the clinic. So firstly, what is epigenetics? Well, there are all different types of cell in the human body and each have their own distinct appearance and function. For example, a neuron in the brain that carries messages looks very different to a muscle cell that contracts and relaxes to help you move. And inside each one of these cells, you can find DNA. This is a genetic code, which you can think of as an instruction manual that contains all the information needed to program the cell to make it look and act in a particular way. And the important point to take home here is that every single cell in a human body contains the exact same DNA code. So for each cell to be functioning differently, there must be something controlling which parts of the DNA instruction manual are being read. And this something is epigenetics. In fact, the term epi literally means on top of. So epigenetics is a chemical modification that sits on top of the DNA, controlling how it is read. And you can think of epigenetics like a highlighter. It's highlighting which specific instructions need to be read by each particular cell. So the simplest way to think of epigenetics is that it's the way in which identical DNA, um, cells with identical DNA can read the DNA differently to become cells which each have their own particular appearance and function. So epigenetics is very helpful in distinguishing different cell types in a normal healthy body, but it also plays a really important role in disease. And we find that in many disorders, the normal epigenetic modifications go awry, leading to a diseased state. In cancer, for example, this can lead to uncontrollable cell growth. And if we go back to the instruction manual analogy, it can mean that whole pages of the manual are thrown out or highlighted. And in cancer, this leads to the runaway proliferation of cells and other changes that cause a tumor. So interestingly, there are lots of different epigenetic marks, but the one that um, I focus on in my research is called DNA methylation. And this is where a small um, chemical group called a methyl group binds to the DNA. Genes are specific chunks of this DNA that are read out to form proteins. And one of the most well-known DNA methylation changes to occur in prostate cancer occurs at a gene called GST pi. So in a normal prostate cell, GST pi is completely unmethylated. But in a prostate tumor cell, GST pi is methylated. <coughs> and I'm showing this here now in real data from our lab. Um, and what this shows is on the bottom is the gene in, in dark blue, GST pi. And every single um, gray vertical line at the top is a position where DNA methylation is possible to occur. Then down below the bars, um, the height of the bars represents the amount of DNA methylation in that cell type. Um, in red, you see the tumor cell, and in blue, the normal cell. And here you can see that in the tumor cell, it has very high levels of GST pi methylation, whereas in a normal cell, it's almost completely unmethylated. Um, and in fact, the DNA methylation change at GST pi is such a specific marker of prostate cancer that it's now being used in commercially available diagnostic tests for prostate cancer. Um, so now to explain about prostate cancer and, and the clinical need. <clears throat> so a typical um, prostate gland sits in front of the rectum and underneath the bladder, and it's roughly the size of a walnut. It's only found in men, and its main function is to produce part of the fluid which makes up semen. And prostate cancer occurs when cells in the prostate state start to grow uncontrollably, forming a malignant growth called a tumor. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer diagnosed in men, with 1.4 million new cancer cases diagnosed globally in 2020 alone. But if it's detected early, most prostate cancers can be successfully managed or treated, often with a radical prostatectomy, which is a surgery to move the whole prostate gland. But whilst this is curative for many, in a small subset of patients, the disease progresses rapidly after surgery, 
with the tumour spreading through the body, leading to death. And indeed, more than 375,000 men die of prostate cancer each year. Clinically, we're very good at diagnosing prostate cancer, but we're less good at prognosis, that is, working out um, which men are going to have the most aggressive form of the disease. So there's a need for more reliable and accurate prognostic markers to guide and improve patient care. The current clinical tools which are used to determine a patient's prognosis after surgery include um, PSA. PSA is prostate-specific antigen, which is a protein that's secreted from prostate cancer cells into the bloodstream. And so the levels of this in, in the blood um, help you to um, tell about the aggressiveness of the cancer. We also use um, pathological features that you can see under a microscope called grade, stage, and margins. There are a number of other techniques um, that are beginning to be used for prognostication, um, including MRI and PSMA PET. Um, I'm not going to talk about these today, but just to say there are some drawbacks, um, including the fact that these are quite expensive um, techniques. We think that DNA methylation is a really promising biomarker for prognosis. And one of the reasons for this is that we know it's one of the earliest molecular changes to occur in prostate cancer. It's also a really stable molecule, so it's very easy to measure in degraded and quite small clinical samples. There have been some early methylation studies into prostate cancer um, that have identified some methylation changes associated with prognosis. However, most of these studies have used techniques that only focus on a small part of the genome. And they've also um, primarily had to use cohorts that only have um, short-term clinical follow-up. So they're not able to assess the relationship between methylation and long-term survival. <clears throat> so now to tell you about our research into um, identifying new epigenetic biomarkers of prostate cancer lethality. This slide gives you an overview of our strategy to try and identify DNA methylation changes associated with death from prostate cancer. To avoid the limitations of um, previous studies, we used a technique called whole genome bisulfite sequencing, um, seen here, WGBS. And the reason we use this in our discovery stage is that it gives a really comprehensive view of the genome. We were also really fortunate to have access to two cohorts of patients with very long-term clinical follow-up data, so 19 and a half years in the discovery and 15 in the validation cohort. In the discovery stage of our work, we used a cohort of 15 patients who had had surgery to treat prostate cancer. Seven of these um, patients died of prostate cancer within 10 years of surgery, and we turned them the lethal group, um, whilst the remaining eight patients were alive at last follow-up. So we turned these the non-lethal group. And importantly, the really um, important thing to remember is that the groups are matched for grade, stage, and margin, so the current clinical markers of prognosis. Um, so we performed methylation profiling on their tumor tissue, as well as four um, normal adjacent tissues for control. And we used this data to identify specific genetic regions that can distinguish between lethal and non-lethal disease. This plot is a visualization of our results, where we found 1,420 differentially methylated regions, and each of these is represented by a row. Red indicates very high levels of methylation and blue very low. So you can see in the majority of cases, the lethal um, patients had much higher methylation than the non-lethal. Out of these regions, we then um, selected the best 18 regions, and these were located near genes and distributed all around the genome. We then worked with researchers at UQ um, to develop a single PCR test that could measure methylation at these sites simultaneously, a PCR-based method. <clears throat> we then went on to apply this test to measure DNA methylation in a second cohort, and this was an independent cohort of 185 prostate cancer patients who had had a rad radical prostatectomy surgery. And over an extensive follow-up period, 86 of these patients experienced a biochemical recurrence, which is a rise in that prostate-specific antigen level in the blood. Um, 25 patients had a metastatic relapse, meaning that the tumor had spread to different regions of the body. And sadly, 16 um, of the patients died of prostate cancer. 
And when we looked at the relationship between our methylation markers and these three different survival outcomes, we found that methylation at five of the genes were associated with biochemical recurrence, at one of the genes with metastatic relapse, and a different five with prostate cancer death. And there was just one methylated region that was associated with all three survival events, and this was a, a gene called Kekna 2D4. Um, these plots are called Kaplan-Meier plots, and they're used to show the survival of patients over time. So on the y-axis, you have the survival of patients, and on the x um, is time. But the main point I want you to take from this is that those patients who had higher levels of Kekna 2D4 methylation, um, shown in red, they show a faster drop, which indicates poorer survival in this group. So we think this gene is a really important epigenetic biomarker of survival. When we use statistical models to compare Kekna 2D4 methylation to the existing measures that are used in the clinic at the moment to predict patient survival, we found that it improved the predictions of biochemical recurrence and of prostate cancer-specific death. So to summarize our study, we ge generated detailed methylation maps of non-lethal and lethal prostate cancer, and we've also uploaded all of this data to public data repositories. So now any cancer researcher around the world who's interested can use this data and mine it for their own um, research. We've identified new regions of differential methylation associated with prostate cancer lethality. And we found that our methylation markers improved the prediction of prostate cancer mortality, um, which we believe um, this prognostic methylation test that we're working on um, holds some promise for clinical application. Um, and we published this work last year in the Journal of Clinical and Translational Medicine, so if anyone's interested, you can read more about it here. So for the next steps in this project, our team were really fortunate um, last year to um, gain some funding from Tour de Cure um, to try and help us validate our prognostic methylation test. This has allowed us to test um, a new cohort of 100 patients from the St. Vincent's Prostate Cancer Biobank. And this time, we're not only going to be looking at um, prostate tissue samples, but also matched blood samples from these patients um, with the aim of developing a non-invasive test. And the reason we think this might work is that there's um, a phenomenon that's been increasingly recognized that tumor cells can shed their DNA into the bloodstream. So you might be able to see the same DNA methylation changes that you see in the tissue in little pieces of circulating tumor DNA in the blood. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in this, um, this work, and in particular the, the patients who generously donated their tissue to the biobank, as well as um, the funders who've supported this work. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to hear from um, Tree, who heads the Precision Immunology Program here at Garvin. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, g'day, how are you going? Um, gonna try and um, get you a bit excited about a new concept that we've been developing over the last year or so at the Garvin Institute, and that's the concept of precision immunology. This is something that um, Professor Alyssa Dienick and I have been working on for a little while. Um, and what I'm gonna try and do in the next few minutes or so is give you a sense of what we're trying to achieve um, and hopefully use that as a thread, and hopefully you can then use your imagination to see where that might lead. So um, it's called, my talk is called What is Precision Immunology? But really, this is about solving mysteries in space and time. And I think it's really important that we recognize that what we're trying to do here is uh, really at the forefront of what's possible. Um, at some, in, in some cases, right, it's almost like science fiction. So. My lab's called the Image Lab. That's not because I'm obsessed with branding, but it's because our lab stands for Intravital Microscopy and Gene Expression. And the reason why we focus on intravital microscopy particularly is because what we're really interested in is this seemingly very simple uh, decision that has to be made here. So what you have on the left is a resting B cell. 
and on the right is a plasma cell. Plasma cells are the cells that make antibodies, and antibodies are really critical for protecting you from infection. That's why we have vaccinations, because they induce protective antibodies that can neutralize the virus when we meet that virus in real time. Plasma cells are also really important because sometimes they go wrong and they make the wrong antibodies. And if those antibodies just happen to react against parts of our body, then th those antibodies can trigger disease. Uh, and we call those antibody-mediated autoimmune diseases. So this seemingly very simple decision that the B cell has to make, do I become a plasma cell, lies at the heart of a lot of what's uh, of immunology, lies at the heart of health, and lies at the heart of disease. And we need to really understand these cell fate decisions, but these are happening deep inside our body in the dark spaces where we can't see and we can't look. And it's really important because um, to understand how we can take advantage of this cell fate decision to make better vaccines, or how we can understand this decision to prevent or treat autoimmune diseases, we really need to know what's going on. And if you actually think about it, this is actually a really important, major, fundamental, and speaking in Sydney terms that you might understand, renovation. Because you, what you're talking about here is taking a resting B cell, which you, you know, might consider as like a small two-bedroom house, and then completely reprogramming it so it becomes this massive factory that's just pumping out huge amounts of antibodies, huge, huge amounts of protein constantly. And so that is a really significant reprogramming step that we really don't understand what's driving it. And so our whole um, raison d'etre is really then to understand how these decisions are made in the dark. So, so really then, if we'd want to solve these mysteries in space and time, go back to when that B cell made that decision to become a plasma cell, we really need to be able to travel backwards and forwards in space and time. Of course, if we were a Time Lord, we can just get into a TARDIS, and that will be all fine. So what's our TARDIS in the lab? I mean, our TARDIS is um, this instrument called an intravital microscope, or more specifically, a two-photo microscope. And this takes advantage of some really sophisticated, you know, Nobel Prize-winning physics to allow us to get deep inside living tissues. We can track live cells inside living tissues inside a living organism. So this is our TARDIS, and we're really lucky at the Garvin Institute to have you know, some very unique, one-of-a-kind instruments that places us at the very forefront uh, in the world in terms of our capabilities. So I'm just going to focus on one disease just to give you an example of our thinking with precision immunology. So this is a biopsy of a kidney of a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. And what you can see here is deposition of autoantibodies that are bound to its target antigen, in this case, double-stranded DNA, in the kidney glomerulus, and activation of complement and then damage to the kidneys. So the question is, what is happening in systemic lupus erythematosus? Well, SOE is a really interesting disease because a lot of people would say, well, if the problem is the plasma cells, if the B cells have become these plasma cells that are making antibodies, isn't the answer just to get rid of all the, all the B cells and get rid of all the plasma cells? And while that might seem like a really clever idea, it does have a lot of drawbacks. It causes widespread immunosuppression because you're non-specifically, right, without precision, destroying the entire immune system, which puts you at risk of infections. The other problem, of course, is that people have had this thought for decades, and they've been trying for decades to target B cells. And so that rather complicated picture on the left is the wiring of a B cell and all the many different ways that all these big pharmaceutical companies have tried to dis target and ablate or deplete B cells. And the problem is that despite like over 30 randomized clinical trials, none of these drugs have um, met their primary endpoint. And in all this time, only one new drug has been FDA approved for treatment of lupus. And even then, it was a very marginal approval. And when we use it in the clinic, it doesn't work very well. And so on the left here is an example of a patient journey. And, and, and this is, you know, for patients, we talk about the, the, um, in terms of odysseys, you know, they can go through a diagnostic odyssey. For lupus, they can also go through a treatment odyssey. And the problem here is because we have all these drugs to choose from. We don't know which drug will work in which patient. And so that really is the, the whole 
point of precision immunology is to try to understand how do we select which patient would benefit from which drug and so we can give it precisely. And so the journey I'm showing you there is a patient who's had lots of different treatments and this is the idea. Because these drugs are expensive, it's sort of like an empirical treatment failure process. You fail first line, you try second line, you fail second line, you try an experimental treatment. What we want to try and do is avoid this whole process so that we can target, um, we, can, we can give patients a specific target treatment that's going to solve their problems. So this is the precision immunology approach. And I'm going to start right back, and, you, and, and even though I've been telling you about B cells, I'm now going to focus you on macrophages. I'm going to take you right back to where that decision gets made. Where does the B cell decide to become a plasma cell? And that happens inside a structure that, that was described by this German um, back in 1885. That's a long time ago. And then Walter Fleming. And when he looked under the microscope, he saw these structures with very big cells inside them. And to them, they looked pregnant because inside them were these bodies that he called tangible bodies. And back then, they thought this is where the cells, your immune system, were being born. Hence the term germinal center. This is where cells were being germinated. Actually, the reality is the opposite of that. These big cells are what cells we would now call macrophages, and their bodies are actually the corpses of dead and dying cells. So the exact opposite of what he was thinking. And so even though they were just described back in 1885, we still don't know very much about these tingible body macrophages. Why, what they are and what they do. And tingible body macrophages became more, more important recently when um, a new type of cancer was disco dis discovered and described called um, Burkitt's lymphoma in, um, in Africa in children with, um, caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. And when they looked in the germinal centers, of, they found that it was filled with these tangible body macrophages. And it gave the, the pathologist the idea that it had a starry sky appearance. So what are these tangible body macrophages and why are they so hard to find? And why are they so important? Well, it turns out that this where these B cells make this decision inside the germinal center, it's a site of intense proliferation. So basically, when you're infected with a virus, the immune system is trying to find the best fit, how to make the best antibody to neutralize that virus. And the way it does that, it, it keeps um, mutating these receptors um, that allows it to recognize the virus. And so the cells divide, they put on their surface new receptors, and then they get selected. And if they, if they are positively selected, if they bind really strongly, then they get chosen to then proliferate and expand and maybe become a plasma cell. But if they don't, or worse still, if they bind to parts of the self, then they're negatively selected and killed. So if you think about it, whenever you have your infection, your glands swell up. That's exactly what's happening in your immune system. The glands contain these B cells, contain these germinal centers, and that expansion, that um, enlargement of your glands is because all these cells are proliferating, they're expanding. Now, the key thing is the flip side of this, which is cell death. And Ben mentioned this earlier. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, and the germinal center is actually a site of intense cell death. So this creates a problem, because what happens to all these dead and dying cells? And the problem arises because normally the cell membrane sequesters the contents of the cell and the nuclear membrane sequesters the contents of the nucleus. And if these dead and dying cells are not cleared away, then all this debris, all this garbage spills out and can activate your immune system to make antibodies against itself. And in lupus, a lot of these antibodies are directed against nuclear antigens like double-stranded DNA. So this is a really, really important point because tangible body macrophages, their function is to clear all this dead and dying cells. And that's why they're full of tangible bodies. They are performing a really important housekeeping function. And we know that when that housekeeping function fails, people develop lupus. So we're going back beyond the step to that decision making. The decision is made because the B cell has seen something that it shouldn't have seen. So how can we fix that? OK, we haven't, don't know much about these cells because even though we've known about them since 1885. And part of the problem is because these cells only appear when you have that infection or when you've been vaccinated and the gland is enlarged, and then they disappear again. So, 
and they're very, very rare, and so we haven't been able to isolate them outside living animals. And that's a critical thing, right? To understand these complex biological processes, we have to see it in the in vivo context um, to be able to find them and to be able to isolate them. So how do we do that? With, the, with our TARDIS, the two-phone microscope, we can make these cells fluorescent. So they glow in the dark, and then we can see them. So in this case here, what we're going to do is we can make the germinal centre, the B cells in the germinal centre, glow green, and we're going to make these macrophages glow red, and then we're going to see, can we see these cells in the germinal centre, and can we see what they're doing? And so this is work by um, uh, Abigail, who, who is a graduate student in the lab, and what you can see here is, that, so the two-photo microscope, what it allows us to do is to take time-lapse movies and, and do it in three-dimensional space. So then when we pull that together, we have a, th a 3D volume over time. So it's, this is actually four-dimensional imaging, right? Um, and you can see then, so the capsule of the lymph node of the, of, 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 the, of, the, of the gland is in blue, and I've taken away some of the colors to make it clearer here, so red are your macrophages, and the, the one that I've highlighted is, a, is the um, tingible body macrophage. And you can see the empty black spaces are the, the vacuoles that have taken up and di digesting and clearing all these dead and dying cells. So we can see all this in real time now, and we can ask ourselves, OK, how do the tingible body macrophages do this? So normally, you would imagine you know, if you had to vacuum a room to collect all the dirt and debris, you, you would walk around the room with a vacuum cleaner. Or if you were the council and you had to clear away all the rubbish bins, you would send trucks up and down the street, get people to take the bins out. So the question we had was, how do the cells do this? How do they clear debt and dying debris? So when we looked, it was very surprising because we were taught if you take these cells out and put them in a test tube, they would chase around things. But actually, that's not what happens in vivo, right? And this is the importance of what we do, because we are seeing the biology as it really is, not something that's imagined in a different context. And you can see here that what the cell does is it's stationary. It doesn't move around. But what it does do is it sends out all these long arms or processes that allow us, that allow the cell to capture and pull in the dead and dying cells. So it has a mechanism to find you know, these dead and dying cells. And, and that's because these dead and dying cells release find me signals um, that, that these macrophages are doing. And so what I've done on the left, or rather what Abigail and Wuna have done on the left there, is track these processes. And the reason why I really like this movie is that it's one of the first few times where I've seen the map of Australia where Tasmania is included. Um, <laughs> and, and so, but, but the key point here is that by sitting still and sending out the processes, that's very unusual, and it's not what we would anticipate and would expect to happen. And the other thing that was really unusual was that the cells, when they're dead, when the cells have died and broken up into small and tiny, tiny fragments, you could imagine a dead cell would not move, would be stationary. But in actual fact, when we watched in real time what's happening, and um, you'll see that the spots will come on to track for you the, the dead cell fragments once it's gone through the z stack. Um, so you see all the small little green dead cell fragments. They're, they're moving. They're not stationary. So this is kind of like some sort of zombie dead cell that's still moving around. So you've got this weird situation where the cell that you think should be moving isn't moving, and the thing that you think is dead and should be stationary and not moving, is moving. And that's one of the great things about what we do, because we always see really surprising, unexpected biology, um, things that we wouldn't have predicted. And so, so you can see here that when we track them, they're moving around. And so how does that work? So, so like I said, normally you'd send a, a garbage truck around, or in the dark ages, you'd send one of the Monty Python crew around to collect all the dead and dying corpses. And it, th this really puzzled us because this is, this is not, how do you understand, how do you explain this? But of course the answer also came from Monty Python because one of the questions they always ask is what's the average airspeed velocity of an African swallow? And the answer of course, it, it depends whether that swallow is fully laden or unladen. 
all right? Because whether it's carrying a coconut or not, and if you think about it, these macrophages, they're getting bigger and bigger because they are grabbing and pulling in all these dead and dying cells, and they're fully laden with all these corpses, these tangible bodies. And so taking a riff from Monty Python that it's a simple question of weight ratios, um, what Wuna did was actually try to quantify these cellular behaviors and ask the question, does this behavior make sense? So I'm now going to talk about albatrosses, not because John Cleese once tried to sell albatrosses at the, uh, at the Hollywood Bowl, but because this paper back in the 90s really changed a lot of thinking of people in ecology. What they did was they put a transmitter on an albatross and watched its behavior as it's searching for prey or fish in the ocean. So because it's got a big wingspan, it can hover for a long time. And what they found was that the albatrosses, they would hover for a long time in one place and then take a big leap or big step or in mathematical terms, what was described as a Levi flight to another spot and then search intensely again. Now, those of you with kids or grandkids around Easter will know that this is exactly what kids do for an Easter egg hunt. They race into a corner, rummage intently, then race to another corner. And as, as it turns out, not only do albatrosses do it, not only do kids do it, but across ecological space, whenever you have a predator-prey situation, this seems to be a search behavior that they all follow. Somehow they all worked out and mathematically these people tried to show that that was the most efficient way to search for rare prey. So when, what you're, when you're a predator trying to find something that's rare, this is the best search strategy, what's called a Levi flight. But that involves running around. That's not what these macrophages are doing. They're sitting still and that didn't quite make sense. And so what Wunner did from, from his mathematical modeling was that he realize that actually, so you've got albatrosses, which are probably like your immune cells, the lymphocytes, the B cells that, that, are, um, that we saw moving around in the journal center. But really the macrophages are more like these bears that are during the salmon run. They just position themselves equally across the stream and wait for the salmon to fly past. And then they just need to send out an arm, grab that salmon and have lunch. And that's exactly what Warner showed was that through this uh, process of multi-parameter optimization, that because the dead and dying cells are moving, it's much more efficient for the macrophages to be stationary and send out these arms than to run around chasing after them. So, so the other thing I was, last thing I was going to say was that this question of these macrophages being really rare and only present when there's a journal center, right? And so we have this problem in terms of nosology where by defining the macrophages by their, billet, their, 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 their appearance of having engulfed all these dead and dying cells, we can't find them when there are no dead and dying cells around for them to engulf. And what we showed um, was that uh, um, these macrophages are actually present in the lymph node before the immunization. Um, and they're present, but they're not recognized as a tangible body macrophage just because they haven't taken on that appearance. And in the ex experiment, I mean, I'm only showing this because in, um, I like, like it when the students blow things up with a laser. What Abigail did was she used the two photon laser to precisely target a small volume inside the journal center, I mean, so inside the, the, the lymph node of a living animal, a small volume that's only about, you know, 20 by 20 by 20 microns, ablated it and killed all the B cells in that area, and then watched what happened to the macrophages. And so, so that ablated RII is the region that, that, she, that she's blown up, basically, and, and the white signal then disappears. And you can see the macrophages in red, and it'll be much clearer when all this, uh, uh, we're only just showing the red signal, that normally they're scanning once we ablate and, and kill the cells within that region, you'll see that never works the way I think it's going to work. <laughs> Here it comes. Okay, you'll see that that one of the macrophages, I think the one over at like one or two o'clock, will send a big arm in and grab. Here it comes and grab a corpse and then pull it back. So we can change the behavior of these cells using the laser. 
And so I'm just going to finish here by, by just saying, okay, so, so we can do a lot of really cool stuff, and I hope I've given you a glimpse of some of the cool things that we can do in the lab. But really, the, the thing that's probably most cool for us is this idea that, okay, everyone's been trying the same thing for decades, trying to target B cells, right, in a very blunt way that doesn't even take it the advantage of the least bit that we've learned about them in terms of the antigen specificity. What we want to do is start thinking about how can you be different? How can you do it differently? And one of the things is, well, let's not just target the B cells. Let's target the thing that's triggered the B cells in the first place. And that is the antigen, right? The bit of the, of the nucleus that's escaped and activated the B cells. And so what we're hoping to develop in the future is ways to target these macrophages or the function of these macrophages so we can improve their ability to clear apoptotic cells and reduce the burden of antigen that these self-reactive B cells are seeing and prevent people actually even developing uh, lupus uh, in the first place. So this is work by incredible number of people in the lab. Uh, um, uh, Abigail and Wuna drove most of that project. That was done in collaboration with folks at Oxford um, University, um, and many other people, and I think I'm just going to stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Tree. Those videos were fantastic. I am um, amazed and slightly terrified that there are zombies and Easter egg hunts and all the rest going on in my lymph nodes. Um, can, I, can, you, can I please um, ask you to join me in thanking all our presenters uh, today for their remarkable <laughs> presentations? And I would just like to ask all our presenters to come back up on stage. Um, we'll start off with a short Q&A. Now, we've got a few questions that have already come through uh, via Zoom. Um, but if you have any burning questions, uh, please feel free to put your hands up and one of our wonderful volunteers will come by with a mic. All righty. So I think just to kick things off, one thing that struck me um, beyond the incredible intersection that is happening um, between immunology, genomics, cancer, is this razor sharp focus on precision medicine, um, targeting treatments to individual patients. Now, I was hoping if um, our speakers today could, could give us a bit of an insight into what their hope is for the future of healthcare um, for people diagnosed with immune disease, with cancers, um, Perhaps we can start with you, Benjamin. Yes. Um, precision medicine is a fairly modern sounding idea, but um, it's essentially just an evolution in the way um, medicine operates. If you think about the history of chemotherapy in cancer, which started in the 1940s and 50s, it was a real trial and error situation where physicians were treating patients um, and children's leukaemia was, was, was really one of the um, test beds for leukaemia with a whole range of, of, of different chemicals, crude chemicals, um, which were known to kill cancer cells in a dish. And the theory was that you could kill cancer in patients too. Um, incredibly crude um, and incredibly difficult studies to conduct. But um, it eventually led to the establishment of chemotherapy as, as one of the mainstays of cancer treatment. But of course, there's lots and lots of different kinds of chemotherapy and there's lots and lots of different kinds of cancer. So over 60 or 70 years, we've gotten exceptionally good at making sure that when you're diagnosed with a particular kind of cancer, that you get the standard of care, which is a, a group of one or more or two um, different chemotherapeutic agents with different mechanisms of action, which have been proven over many, many decades and many, many studies to be the best in that particular type of cancer. So in most cases, it's not targeted at a specific molecular lesion um, that we can diagnose now with the kind of genomic technologies discussed today. But it is precision medicine in the fact that it's been refined over decades by clinicians and scientists to make it more and more and more and more targeted at that particular kind of cancer. So the fact that we can now sequence a single cell of a tumour and actually pinpoint the actual nucleotide amongst the three billion in your DNA that is mutated and then target that with a specific drug 
is, is an absolutely mind-bending advance. But the concept of precision medicine is, has been around, um, I guess, for, for decades and decades. So it's really just the sophistication of the technology, um, the, the specialization of, of the kind of studies we're doing, um, and also the recognition that there are many, many different therapeutic modalities now and many, many diseases uh, that look similar are actually quite different at a molecular level. It's a great answer. <laughs> Would anybody like to add to that? Trick? I, I mean, from a precision immunology point of view, I, I guess lupus is a really good example of the vision that we want to push forward, which is that at the moment, a lot of our diagnoses are syndromic. You know, um, we tick boxes in terms of the symptoms that they have, in terms of the clinical signs they have, and then we have classification criteria. What we want to do is move away from a syndromic diagnosis to almost like a molecular classification of disease so that in the same way, for example, cancer has made this great leap away from classifying cancers by, the, by anatomy, by the, the tissue that's diseased. Take the example of breast cancer rather than saying you've got breast cancer. You can say, you know, at a molecular level, you've got a breast cancer that's expressing, say, HER2. What that opens has been was saying is then the ability to then using a targeted therapy that targets that HER2 molecule on the breast cancer. In the same way, what we're hoping is to develop a molecular taxonomy that classifies a patient so that we know, for example, a lot of these autoimmune diseases, because it's syndromic, they're overlapping and there's probably 10, 20 different diseases all rolled in one and we give them all the same treatments. With a molecular taxonomy, we will be able to precisely diagnose and treat the patients with a precise drug that targets the molecular pathway that's perturbed. Wonderful. We do have a few questions coming in through the Zoom room. Um, we've got one wonderful in, uh, individual who is 78 and has fibromyalgia, uh, which is sporadic, and she has um, increasing osteoarthritis um, associated with arthritic flares. Uh, while we, of course, can't um, comment on individual cases, uh, she is interested in whether those two conditions might be genetically linked. I'm wondering if um, perhaps Etienne, you'd like to comment on that? So it's a good, it's a good question. The, the short answer is that I don't know much about the genetic links between fibromyalgia and osteoarthritis. Um, but I think one of the big opportunities with what I'm doing what I'm focusing on is this idea that as we start to work more and more closely with clinicians and, and as we start to integrate these amazing technologies more and more into their clinical workflows that there are individuals for which now we're going to be able to start to track immune cells and other cells between all of the different compartments. So in individuals who have interstitial lung disease will be able to study immune cells taken from lung aspirates. We've got a patient um, next week who's had longitudinal aspirations of their joints several times and is now getting a knee replacement and removal of something that's called a Baker's cyst. So it's not a direct answer to this question, but the point that I'm making there is that what we're going to be able to start to do is actually track the different types of cells within these compartments and actually try and understand whether the same cells are causing various manifestations in people with, for example, fibromyalgia and osteoarthritis, or whether they're unrelated or whether they're in direct effects. And we can start to tease that apart for the first time. So that's probably as close as I can come to providing some insight there. But Tree may know more about the genetic associations. I was hoping you would. <laughs> no, thank you for providing that overview. Um, have we got any questions from the auditorium? Please don't be shy. We have another question via Zoom um, asking about the presentations, uh, particularly uh, Ruth's pre presentations about um, the epigenetic links of prostate cancer. And I just wanted to um, uh, indicate that, yes, all the, the, um, the presentations will be available, um, recorded, um, and will be shared after the presentation today. Um, someone who wanted to share um, your particular work with their oncologist. Uh, one question. Oh, yep. No, we've got a question up the front. <laughs> Um, is there a difference between what we'd call a flare and the exacerbation of symptoms? Are they distinct? 
Yeah, it's a good question. They, they, they can be distinct. The, the concept of flare is a really severe worsening in the severity of people's symptoms. Um, and depending on the condition, they, they can be more or less restricted in time. So what we sometimes see is that the flares sort of resolve more rapidly, and that can be distinct from a progressive worsening of disease. So in the context of osteoarthritis, for example, that with continued load onto affected joints, you can still see worsening of disease without necessarily classing it as a, as a flare. But it is a bit of a blurry distinction. Um, and I should tell you that I, I've sort of cheated my way into getting into as clinical um, medical research as I can, but I am... My background is not as a rheumatologist per se. And the, the big strength here is that I work next door and I meet weekly with the head of the rheumatology department next door and other rheumatologists and other surgeons. And so I think it's, it's that intersection that's really precious here. Um, yeah. Another question over there. Thank you. Look, uh, listening to all four presenters this morning, I'm struck by the incredible knowledge, the know-how that clearly exists in the garden. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, all of this is also being uh, shared around the world. This is not just something that's all locked up within GARB, and you're working very collaboratively with other organisations. Um, but the question in my mind is, to what extent have you been able to commercialise some of the, uh, the know-how that you've got? Yep. Um, are you sure you're not a member of our board? Because that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the question they've been asking me. Um, it, it, thank you for the question and the comment. The, the comments are appreciated. I think... Um, I'm, I've spent a little bit of time dealing with industry and, and biotech and, um, and at one point was considering whether to join you know, the biotech industry, but um, made a decision to stay in academic science for, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that sort of social aspect. You know, we, we fill a gap that the, the industry doesn't fill. We generate knowledge, we generate it and we share it and we collaborate across the globe. Um, so there's... There's something about academia that's really special. It's that collaborative spirit, um, being part of an international effort, essentially. Um, and it's unlikely that any one researcher or any one institution is going to cure a disease. But um, communicating what we do, publishing what we do, um, sharing it, um, knowledge at conferences, etc., it's it's part of the fun, part of the joy of being an academic. So yeah, Garvin is very, very proudly um, academic in that regard. Obviously, though, we are spending taxpayers' money. Um, and we are spending donor money. Um, and both the taxpayer and donors would expect that where there is an opportunity to, to capture some, some of the value of the intellectual property that we generate, that we look after it, that we protect it, and we translate it and commercialise it. So in that space, what we do is, is translational. A lot of what we do is translation, and, and the sort of work that Ruth's been talking about, that ability to to identify um, diagnostic biomarkers and then turn that into a, a diagnostic tool that's likely to have immediate translational impact in the clinic. Will it have commercial impact? That's to be determined. And I think that's where Garvin has some work to do. We've been very good at translating work, making an impact in patients' lives. What we haven't been very good at is determining where there's an opportunity to partner early on with industry to then develop something that's got a particular application in, in cancer or autoimmune disease that has novel drug-like properties, for example. So it's hard to do, as we know. If, if it was easy, we'd all be um, designing new drugs and, and uh, curing diseases. But there are opportunities for Garvin, I think, to be um, more effective in the way it spots those opportunities as they emerge in the Institute. And rather than just immediately publish them and put them out into the world, figure out whether there's an opportunity to, to take that next step towards not just translation, but commercialisation as well. It's something we're really, really conscious of because ultimately we want, to have we want to have impact in the clinic and we also would like to capture a little bit of the value such that we can sustain ourselves um, and, and invest more in our research endeavour. So in a perfect world, it's a bit of a, uh, a virtuous cycle and one that I'm very conscious of and will be working very hard on the next five years. Um, and my board remind me at every board meeting that we have. So um, <laughs> it's a very good question, a very timely one. Another 
another question from the audience. Um, this is Patrice. You know the um, macrophages? After they put in all the rubbish and they think, what happens to them? That is a great question. And I think that's one that um, we're hoping to answer soon. Um, we, we don't have the answers yet. There's some really interesting and exciting concepts that we're developing. I think cells like your local council might be greener than you think. Um, and so if you imagine all these cells that are dead and dying, at the same time, there are all these cells that are dividing and being born. New cells are being formed. Where do the raw materials for those cells come from? So it's a very, very tough question that we want to ask right now is, is there a mechanism by which the debris that we think is rubbish actually can be recycled and put into new cells? I've probably given away our next big paper. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a sneak peek today. <laughs> Any further questions? Um, Etienne, I was wondering, I was fascinated to hear that essentially a fluid that's removed during surgery is such a precious resource for research. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you collaborate with clinicians and whether those precious samples are maybe shared around Garvin more widely or whether other researchers are taking a similar approach? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's something I'm actually really passionate about because I think there's there's so much unmet need and there are so many unmet opportunities. So to give you an example, there are a thousand roughly hip and knee replacements next to St. Vincent's private clinic, and every time that surgery happens, we could be, if logistics were there and, and enough people were working on it, we could be studying those samples. And that's one example amongst myriad examples. And I think, and it's no... Um, criticism of the, the medical system, it's just a different function, which is that when the clinician sees the patient, their function is to immediately treat their symptoms and reduce their pain and, and manage their disease. And so we need to be actively, we can't passively be doing this, we need to be actively building the processes whereby when samples are taken for clinical care or management, that they immediately get repurposed to maximum effect. And so we're doing that for arthritis, but we've also built this growing, it's called exceptional responders, this growing sort of effort to try and collect samples in various cases that other researchers can use. And so um, specifically within arthritis, there's about seven other scientists now in various ways who are studying the samples. But I think the same approach um, is, is critical. And I know Garvin's emphasizing and other places emphasizing these kind of biobanking strategies a lot going forwards. Yep. Uh, I believe Professor Lynn March is the comment. She's heading up what's the biobank. Yeah, that's right. So she's heading up this, this um, effort called the A3BC, um, which traditionally is primarily focused on collecting blood from large numbers of, of people. Uh, but I think where they're going, where a lot of people are going, is to try and really, as I mentioned, go tissue first. We know that the cells that are in the joints in this context or in the context of heart disease and the plaques are the ones that are causing problems. So those are the ones we need to be studying. Any further questions? Ruth, I was going to ask you, um, epigenetics is a, an absolutely mind-boggling concept. Um, and I understand that the technology that's used to actually look at the genome to the level of detail that you're investigating um, has made step changes over the past few years. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that, the technology that's underpinning your research. Um, yeah, so our, the main technology we use for, well, it, it's all um, come from the Human Genome Project, really. You know, that was a huge 15-year endeavor to sequence the um, 3 billion base pairs that's in each cell. And, and we thought we'd have a lot of information from that, but then people found that there weren't as many genes as they were expecting to find. And then this whole new layer of complexity was discovered as the epigenome. So we still very much use sequencing techniques. We look at the A's, T's, C's, and G's of the genome in epigenetic study, but we, we tweak the, um, the, the sequence so that um, the, the sites that have a little like methyl group or other modifications, 
they show up on the sequence there is a slightly different um, letter. Um, so that technology was first used for small parts of the genome and um, the work of um, my lab head, um, Susan Clark, um, took this to the whole genome level. And that means that we can look um, all, all over the genome. And now this method's getting more and more sensitive. At first you needed a lot of samples and now we've, we're able to look in um, smaller amounts of tissue, um, taking it to um, these really sensitive, what they call PCR methods, like what was used for your COVID um, tests, so that um, you can look at these degraded tissues and also um, potentially the circulating tumor DNA in the blood. But yeah, it's all very much hanging on these, the, the work that's come before from the big sequencing program. Perhaps a silver lining of COVID um, that we now all know the term PCR. Mm -hmm. I think so. <laughs> Is there any more questions? Yep. Hi, Viv. Um, there's a question from the Zoom room that I think was missed, and it was, what is the progress on Crohn's disease? Anyone like to take that? Um, tree. I was wondering if you'd like to take that one. <laughs> um... Crohn's disease. Um, it's not normally a disease that we um, look after in clinical immunology. It's more one for the gastroenterologist, but definitely I think Crohn's disease is a really good example of the intersection between and a move towards you know, some of the precision immunology concepts that I was elaborating on. I mean, increasingly we are finding patients with immune diseases with mutations in different genes that give rise to inflammation in their gut. So so they're, you know, and a lot of these overlap with big population-based studies where they've looked, um, using a, me uh, a method called GWAS, looked at associations between, um, uh, you know, changes in genes that are, that are maybe a bit more common than the very, very rare um, mutations that occur in diseases. And some of these overlap. And so what's emerging is the idea that actually a lot of the inflammatory bowel diseases, of which Crohn's is one, the other main one being ulcerative colitis, uh, many of these diseases may have signatures that might mean that they are better treated by one um, uh, pathway inhibitor than another. Um, the other big change, I guess, in the, in the inflammatory bowel disease space and one that we haven't touched on is the idea that actually your gut, uh, within your gut, is this enormous microbial community. And so they're all these bacteria in the gut and these bacteria are also producing lots of metabolites and they are all activating and interacting with the immune system in some way or other. And a lot of these mutations that, that all, all these polymorphisms that people have described impact on the ability of the immune system to interact with your, the microbiota in the gut. And some of this sort of has led, you know, um, it's led some, shed some light, for example, in some of the ways we treat it in um, Crohn's disease, for example, in the past, for example, things like elemental diet, some of these are actually impacting on these microbial communities. Um, and in fact, people are now, for example, trialing things like, um, uh, I don't know what the OFA term for it is, but essentially it's um, uh, fecal transplants from, from healthy donors to, to people um, with inflammatory bowel disease. Sorry, that was long. <laughs> Thank you, Tree. Have we got some? I think we might have time for one more question. Yes, we've got one up the back. With the autoimmune diseases that you study, is it likely that in years to come you would study other types of? autoimmune diseases and set up trials for those? Yep. Etienne and Tree, what I'll, other... I'll quickly point? start and then you can carry forwards, which is that there are many autoimmune diseases being studied currently at Garvin in addition to, to lupus and arthropathies that you heard about today. Uh, and so there's a lot of ongoing efforts there with precision immunology, with multiomics, genomics, um, metabolomics. Uh, and yeah, I guess Tree can talk a bit more about some of those. So, so, so we have plans to conquer the world. <laughs> and I would say to you that probably every disease is an immune disease. And the example I'm going to give you is cardiovascular disease. So a few years ago, there was a large trial where they used 
an inhibitor of a cytokine called IL-1, because we know they knew that people who had heart attacks, those who had elevation of a mark of inflammation in their blood were at higher risk of death. And so they trialed giving this uh, inhibitor called canakinumab and I one in monoclonal antibody, and those patients did better. They then did one step, took it one step further and went, okay, well, that's a fairly expensive drug. What about a common drug that we use that's really, really cheap to treat gout, colchicine? They got the same effect. So increasingly, I think you'll find that sitting at the heart of everything is the ability of our body to respond to damage, to heal, and healing involves inflammation and inflammation involves the immune system. And increasingly, I think what we'll find is that we as a species had never evolved to live this long. And so the way our immune system is set up is disconnected to how long we've lived. And so many of the diseases of aging, I think we'll find are immune disease. And that's really exciting because that means there are even more precision medicines for us precision immunology methods for us to discover. Thank you, Tree. I think that's about all that we have time for today. So um, if you could please join me in thanking all our speakers today. Please, if you have any questions following on from today's presentation, please feel free to email us at foundation at garvin.org.au. Um, I just wanted to take this moment to thank you all so much for coming. Um, we know that many of you are donors, partners for the future, volunteers, absolutely critical members to the Garvin family. And I just wanted to take this moment to say thank you so much for coming out today and um, for you know, engaging with us here and um, yeah, for all your wonderful support. Thank you. Thank you.